title of our discussion, The Journalist is Revolutionary, significantly overstates my qualifications because I'm not a journalist and I'm more of a counter revolutionary Actually, than a revolutionary. Iran, I can't make can out you, what you're saying. Can you hear me? No. Can, can anybody hear me there? You can hear me there. Okay. You can't hear me. Now you can hear me. Okay. 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 The title of our session, The Journalist as Revolutionary, significantly overstates my qualifications because I'm not a journalist and not much of a revolutionary, but it significantly understates Adaf Soif's qualifications. She is a journalist, a revolutionary, an art historian, a literary critic, an essayist, a short story writer, and a novelist. So, Duff, I thought I'd start off by asking, <laughs> sorry, which, which is the most important on that list? What's the connection between those, all those different possibilities that you've explored? Oh, you're asking me to, uh, to make sense of my life, actually, and I, I don't know that I can do that. Um, I think maybe, maybe um, empathy is an important thing, uh, certainly for a writer of fiction, you need to, um, I don't know, you, you, you need to, to be able to and to want to put yourself in other people's shoes. Um, and so m maybe that also translates into um, into standing up for uh, revolutionary ideals when possible, since a revolution is about making people's lives better. So I guess maybe that's that's a connection. Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's been it's been a number of years now since a map of love uh, came out. How have your views about that book changed, and how has your life changed around that particular novel? Um, well, I, I, I don't know that my view on the book has changed. I think that uh, you, you, you write a book, you create something, and you send it out there into the world, and then it kind of almost doesn't even belong to you anymore. It belongs to every reader who, who reads it and, 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 and takes it into their heart. Um, so, um, I'm, I, I, I'm fond of the book and I'm very touched. I mean, this book was written now, it was published 16 years ago. And so when people still talk to me about it or sort of express warm feelings towards it or indeed towards um, In the Eye of the Sun, which is the novel that came out before that, then of course that makes me feel very uh, touched and, and, and very proud. And, and somewhere, somewhere in my heart, I suppose, <clears throat> I believe that um, that those those are the things that remain. I mean, for 16 years now, I've been writing uh, what you could loosely call cultural activism or uh, political culture essays. Um, and while that has been important for me, or it has been something that I, I can't see how I could have not done it, but um, the thing that actually stays with people and, I don't know, I mean, changes people's inner landscape a little bit is, is fiction. Okay. And to inch closer to, to home, you're also a founder of the Palestine Festival of Literature. Why Palestine and what is the hold that Palestine has on your imagination, your sympathies on many peoples, Palestine, Israel, why is a small region of, what is it, 11, 12 million people so important? Well, I think that um, certainly before, at the moment, of course, in our region, we're, we're living a, a, a terrible time, a, a time of absolute mayhem, and um, Syria doesn't bear uh, thinking about too closely, and uh, there's obviously other upheavals elsewhere. But um, prior to that, the thing in the region that stood out um, more than anything else was Palestine. And Palestine 
is to me and to a lot of people, um, it's, it is the gravest injustice remaining from the old colonial system. In a way, it is, it's, it's, um, it's an anachronism. It's uh, a white Western settler colonialism um, continuing to happen and continuing to take place. And it's a huge injustice. Um, and it's also in this time of, uh, of um, like the level of media communication that we have, uh, social media, the level of information that people have. I mean, every day, you, on my Twitter feed, there are at least 30 short videos uh. of um, aggression, Israeli aggression against the Palestinians. And yet, somehow, it carries on. It carries on and it, it sort of pr progresses and grows. And so basically, yeah, I mean, my sympathy was engaged with uh, the, the, the Palestinian story from well, really from uh, being a child in uh, Nasser's Egypt. And then I went for the first time in 2000, uh, when the first Intifada started, the Guardian sent me to write reportage from there. And I was there for a week. And um, I just felt that however much you had read about it, however much you'd been brought up on the justice of the Palestinian cause, uh, there was nothing to equal actually seeing it on the ground, seeing how the Palestinians were managing to, to live with grace and dignity and maintaining values such as hospitality, such as um, the importance of art, the importance of education, and so on, while under a growing and, and coming closer threat. So having, having written the piece for The Guardian in 2000, and then again in 2003, uh, that time with my 19-year-old son with me, and so I also had the insight into the feelings of, of Palestinian mothers as they see their, their sons sort of being um, in harm's way. Um, I then, with friends, uh, one of whom is, is actually here uh, at this festival, Bridget Keenan, we're thinking, what do we do? You know, what can we do apart from writing and speaking? And we came up with this idea of the Palestine Festival of Literature, which basically takes authors, um, authors who are, who are not already sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, but whose work shows um, a level of interest in uh, humanity and justice, and, um, and taking them to Palestine just to uh, read, uh, to do seminars, not, not on a political mission, but just to be there and engage with students and engage with audiences. And because of the checkpoints, um, it's very hard for people, for Palestinians, to move from one city to, to another because of the Israeli checkpoints. And so Palfest turned into a, 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 a traveling festival. So for six days, uh, you wake your authors up in the morning, you get them with their luggage onto a bus, you take them through a checkpoint where they have to get off the bus and carry their luggage through the checkpoint and be yelled at through the megaphones and so on. Um, and then they get into, say, uh, Ramallah or Jerusalem or Bethlehem, and they go to a university and they find normal students like they have everywhere. Uh, in Europe, but these are also engaged and challenging and they've read stuff and so on. Um, and then they have a look around the city and see the aspect of the occupation that is there. And then they have a literary event in the evening, uh, reading, music, whatever, sleep, get on the bus and do it again next day. So it's kind of a way of, it's, one is, it's, um, it's a way of showing respect to the Palestinians who are insisting on maintaining a cultural life and on being part of the conversation in the world <clears throat> by bringing people in to see them. And it's a way of al allowing the visitors the experience of living as closely as possible like a Palestinian for a week. And then we let it go and see what happens. <laughs> One of your most recent books is about Cairo. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about 
the centrality of that city for you, how it's changed, its mixture of tradition and liberalism, and its importance for you as a, a writer and a person? Right, well, <clears throat> I think that, um, I think that Cairo as, uh, I mean, the city has, has, has been present in, 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 well, in both novels and of course then in this, in this book, the memoir that is um, dedicated to it. And I think I was exceptionally lucky really in that uh, the geography of my upbringing was that um, uh, my, my, my parents, my mother went to England to do a PhD in English literature when I was four and uh, my father and I went with her and when we came back I was um, seven and they rented, no, nobody used to buy in Cairo then, so they rented a, an apartment in Zamalek. Uh, now those of you who know Cairo know that Zamalek is an island in the river, it's like 10 minutes from downtown Cairo, so it's very central, but it's, it's an island, it's very pretty, it's got trees, it's got the Gezira Club, and it also had my school on it, so my school was two minutes walk from, which is why they chose that apartment. So that was where my mom and dad, my school, my club were. Across the river in two directions, one to the old commercial heart of the city, Ataba, were my maternal uh, grandparents and in the other direction also towards the city uh, at Abdin which is a traditional kind of um, but non-commercial area were my other grandparents and so I had these axes to, to, to my life Zamalek representing uh, modernity really and a kind of elegant modernity um, my one set of grandparents representing a kind of um, a kind of um, like my gra my great grandfather on my father's side was a alim in al azhar, so this was an intellectual class that was kind of on its way out. Like you know, they didn't have much money, but they had a lot of pride and so on. And then over there were my mother's family, who were commerce, small industry, money, but not right. trusting the state and so on. And so I, I my childhood was all in that axis and it was very varied in terms of, uh, I don't know, everything really, uh, faith, um, cultural practice, languages spoken and, 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 and yet it was all completely natural to me. Mm. So that is always there in the books, I think. Okay. No, it's very interesting. Um, let, me, let me read you something you wrote uh, about five years ago, because I think one of the things I, I'm very interested in is the way in which your life and thinking has been intertwined with the events of the last five years in Egypt around the Middle East. You wrote, 25 January 2011 was when everyone who had opposed Mubarak's regime or who had wished they dared to oppose it came together and for a long miraculous moment acted as one. And then if you read your work over the last five years, it's been an extended analysis of that process. So maybe the first segment we can talk about is what conclusions did you arrive about Mohamed Morsi's regime and how long did it take you to change your mind about them or, or to become more skeptical about Morsi's outlook? And what do you think happened to, to that regime at the end? Okay, um, okay, Mohamed Morsi, I think that basically uh, a lot of us were skeptical from the very beginning. However, we really had no choice. If you believed in the democratic process, then you had to, to, to back him. Right. Um, I think that, but, but he, he, lost, he lost the whole country very, very quickly. And I think that a key point um, really, and, 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 and the key to the, the kind of mistake that he made and insisted on making was, um, and if you'll bear with me, this will take a couple of minutes, we, we went to elections under the auspices of, uh, of SCAF, the military, um, in early 2012. And, um, 
there was, uh, there was Muhammad Morsi was the candidate for the Muslim Brotherhood, and General Ahmad Shafi was, we believe, the candidate for the military, and he was certainly the candidate for the old regime, for the Mubarak regime, which the revolution had been against. And then there were um, one, two, three, four candidates that you could loosely, uh, that, that, you could, that, that actually belonged to the revolution, some more than others. Um, and we could not get them to work together. So in the run-up to the elections, people, I mean, the representations that were made to these four people, um, the pressure that we tried to, to bring on them to all back one of them, whichever one it was, or to declare uh, you know, that they were going to run together as a presidential council or something, and they wouldn't. The only one who would was Khaled Ali, and he was the most junior and the one with the least following. Everybody else would not work together. And that was, um, so basically, when we went to that first round of elections, uh, Morsi and Shafi each got around five million. One of the revolutionary candidates got about four and a half. Together, the revolutionary candidates got 12, and it couldn't be counted because they weren't working together. So we had to have a runoff, and the runoff was between the two winners. And so we were in this horrible situation of having to either to choose either Morsi, the Brotherhood candidate, or Shafi, the old regime candidate, or to ruin our ballots. And personally, I was going to go and ruin my ballot, and then I stood there and I thought, if the old regime comes into power, democratically elected, I will never forgive myself. And at least Morsi, even though the leadership of the Brotherhood is not that good, but that we met so many of the young Muslim Brotherhood members who were terrific in the revolution and who were ready to change and to work together with other people and so on. And at least the Brotherhood were also for change. So I voted for Morsi, and many of us did. So um, basically he won. And what happened was that in that second round of elections, both Morsi and Shafi, even though Morsi won, they were very, very close. And each one of them added 8 million votes to his original 5 million. Now, what that means is that when Morsi came to power as president, he should have realized that even though he had won, he had won by a very narrow margin, and that even though he had won by 12 million, or whatever it was, 13, that basically the only people who really wanted him were the 5 million who had voted for him in the first place. And that the 5 plus 2, this, the the seven million who voted for him in the second round voted for him because they couldn't bear the other candidate, and that the seven million who had voted for the other candidate had done so out of fear of the Muslim Brotherhood. So he should have taken that into account, that he was, this was a divided country that was trying to rally behind him, um, and he should have really, as he had said he would work for everyone, he didn't. And Briefly, when he, there, was, there were several things, but key were that he declared, uh, he, he, he very quickly after his election, um, declared, a, 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 what they call it a constitutional declaration, where he suddenly put himself beyond the constitution and beyond um, accountability in order to uh, create the committee that was going to write the new constitution. Now, he was so attacked that he backed off, but he had already created the committee that was to write the constitution. For example, that was one thing. A very ongoing thing was that he was as intolerant of, now remember this, this is a country in the ferment of a revolution. Um, and so when the first parliament met, um, there were marches there were four massive marches from different parts of the city representing uh, 
the, the legal community, the, the arts and academics, the workers, marching to Parliament to remind the members of Parliament that we had put them there. And when we got to Parliament, it was surrounded by young Muslim Brotherhood cadres who'd been shipped in from the provinces with bicycle chains and sticks and so on to prevent people um, reaching. A major thing that he did was that he actually just turned his back on all the, the demands and the kind of, um, like, for example, the revolution had happened on the 25th of January 2011 because that was police day and the revolution had started as a, a massive protest against police brutality. Now one of the first acts that Mohamed Morsi as president did was to go attend a graduation ceremony at the police academy and to say that the police were at the heart of the revolution and that God had miraculously fixed things that the revolution happened on police day. He consistently, like, um, how do you say? You can say sucked up, you can say, got, like, made himself close to the military and to the police, pay rises, um, medals and honors for people who had, you know, two weeks before been killing people on the street. So he was seen to very clearly turn against, and then on the economic uh, thing, the Muslim Brotherhood had been saying forever that loans from the um, international organizations, the IMF and so on, were haram. They were sinful because they involved interest. That was the Muslim Brotherhood position. The revolutionary position was that we did not want any more loans. We wanted to work out a way of, um, you know, fixing the economy from, from within. His first act, not his first act, but very close to first act as president, was to approach the IMF for a loan. So, you know, and these are just the things that there is time to mention. So he very quickly, very quickly lost the country. And then it was easy for a group of young people to go around with a, a, a sort of um, application form for everybody to sign. But what people signed up for was the demand that he, that Morsi, supervise early presidential elections, that we didn't want this system for four years and that we should have early presidential elections. That was then um, taken over by the military and by the intelligence services and turned into deposing him and putting them in his place. It's, it's very interesting you say this. Um, let, me, let me put something to you that, that, that you may disagree with, but I think in South Africa, we've been learning that there are certain limits to constitutional liberalism when your population is not inherently tolerant or educated or um, in liberalism or committed to liberalism. And that when people are given a choice between the possibility of a job or grant and the, the rights that writers hold very dear, First Amendment type rights as Americans call them, rights of free expression, um, First Amendment rights evaporate and political tolerance evaporates. And you, in several of your writings, you actually, you mentioned graffiti as an example of a kind of insult that a state can't endure, right? Because it's informal and it disfigures the perfect image of the state. In, a, in the longest version you have it, you talk about the state needing to be protected from attempts to tarnish its image, from jests, irreverence, and foul language, from students, artists, trade unions, graffiti, football fans, journalists and photojournalists. And I wondered, where do you, where's the profession of a writer fit in there? Is, do you feel very close to the graffiti artist in that sense, as someone who disfigures the perfect image of the state? I think that um, if, I, if, I, if I could choose what I could be now, it would be a graffiti artist, really. It's, there's something so immediate about the work that they do. Um, that uh, it, it, it's just extremely uh, attractive to me. Um, yeah, you know, it's a very odd situation to be in, and I don't know if you go through this here in India periodically, um, this thing of disfiguring the state, of somehow, that it, it, it sort of doesn't matter that the things are happening, what matters is that you talk about them, and you talk about them outside the purported family, 
as it were. So first of all, there's that whole patriarchal, hierarchical thing of we are a family. And that is one of the things that the young revolutionaries like completely don't accept. I mean, they spend a lot of their time saying we are not a family and you are not our father. You know, every time some old person stands up and says, Abne'i, my children, they go, we are not Abne'ak. So the notion that there is a space within which you might be permitted to say, I don't really like this way of doing things, and then outside that, that space you're not supposed to talk is, is, is very strong and has become stronger. Now, again, in that miraculous period of revolution, that just wasn't there. There was a complete openness to the world. And in, in fact, during that first year, a lot of the things that we knew about but were unspoken came out and many many of us thought that was really really healthy you know societal issues and so on now of course anyway actually you know just yesterday there was a new directive from the egyptian government that egyptians should not respond to polls conducted by non-state organizations because I mean you know can you believe it because this was information that was somehow dangerous uh, everything is dangerous to them never mind that they're you know buying arms for billions every year but yet ev every whisper actually if I may I would just like to take this occasion I know that this is a literary um, conference but I would just like to take this occasion to talk very briefly and put the pictures up of two young people, we're talking about journalism, revolutionary activism, and in Egypt at the moment, we have about 80 journalists who are in prison, um, actually in prison. This is, never mind the ones who have court cases pending, never mind that the, um, the three top people in the uh, National Union of Journalists now have two-year prison sentences on each one of them. But the two young men that I would like to just put their picture up, if you would kindly put the picture up for me. Um, okay, the, the, the young man with the victory sign, horsing around with his friend there. His name is uh, down, you can see it down there. His name is Mahmoud Abouzid Shaukan. Have you got it up on the screen? Yeah, um, Shaukan, thank you. And he, he is a photojournalist. He is a brilliant photojournalist. He was uh, arrested in August 2013. Um, he was already working with uh, Demotics, for example. He was working with the top agencies in the world. And if we had had time, I would have shown you his pictures. Amnesty have put on a show of his images um, in London last week and CPJ in New York a few months ago. Uh, he was taken. No, this is another one, sorry. This is another young man. This is another young man. So basically, we've lost... Okay, here he is. What? Could I have my young man, please? No, this one. There's another image of him that I want you to see, which is this one. Here, he's in his... He's in the dock in court, and of course, he's mimicking a camera. Now, there was a big... Um, you may have heard of uh, the Rabah massacre. That was when a sit-in by supporters of Mohammed Morsi was broken up by force. And in one day, the military killed um, at least 800 people, possibly 1,000. And that nobody's been tried for it. Nothing at all has happened. Um, and a lot of young people were picked up that day and on the days following. And if you happen to have a camera with you, then you were particularly susceptible. Now, Shao Ken, actually his specialization was more sort of social kind of pictures rather than political ones, but he happened to be in the street that day and they took him away. Now, he's been in prison since then. That is more than, I'm not doing anything, it's all the guys at the back. Um, so. Uh, this is more than three years that he's been in prison. He was 26 when they took him. And he hasn't, not only has he not been tried, he's not even been charged. And that's why he continues to wear the white, because once you're actually in a process of being 
uh, of being brought to trial, um, you know, when, you, when you have a sentence passed against you, you wear blue. So he's still in the white because actually he is still what they call on remand pending trial, uh, unknown charges. For over three years, he's contracted now um, hepatitis, he's all sorts of things because the other thing is, and I think this will probably strike a chord here, Egyptian prisons are appalling in terms of food, in terms of medical care. Um, and so staying three years in prison, you don't just lose the three years and what that does to your life, career, family, and so on, you come out in a different state of health. So that is something that stays with you forever. So this is Shaukan Mahmoud Abu Zaid, who's been there for three years. And the other young man, and here he is, um, I just you know, chose these pictures because I like them. Um, and the other young man, okay, no, yes. This is Omar Abdul Masood, who was on his first assignment, having graduated from uh, media and gotten a job with a paper. He was on his first assignment when he was picked up. And uh, sadly for him, his first assignment happened to be photographing the seven-day party. There was a young woman who was arrested and she became famous because she'd been pregnant and eventually she had given birth while handcuffed to her bed. So that had become a cause celebre and they had had to let her go. So when she had the seven day after birth celebration for her baby, he was sent by his paper to cover it. He was picked up. Eventually his two brothers were picked up and a friend who'd been visiting them. All the four young men have been in prison. One of them was an international swimmer for Egypt. And I mean, Everybody has a life. And he, the other thing about him was that he had just got married. Um, no, here we go. This is his picture with his bride on their wedding day. Um, and in fact, what they had done, uh, those, the Muslims among you will know that you sign the marriage contract and then you have the actual wedding and consummation a few weeks later. So they'd signed the contract, but they hadn't moved in together yet. And so she's now been three years agitating for him. Um, so basically, yeah, this is, this is kind of, um, <laughs> I don't quite know where I began here, but I, I just, I feel, I feel that we have about 60,000 political prisoners in Egypt now. Um, some of them belong to the Islamist trends, a lot of them belong to the revolution, and a lot of them uh, are people who just got picked up, who were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, who were just taken from the street to make up the number that that particular police uh, raid had to hand in that day. And um, given that the judiciary has now become so co-opted in Egypt and so very much part of the regime, um, and given that the media as well has become co-opted, the only thing that we seem to be able to do for these young people now is to uh, just remember them and to mention them and to keep talking about them at every possible opportunity as long as we can. And so this is why I have done this. Now we can <laughs> go back to <laughs> literature. <laughs> Thank you. May, may they soon be freed. Um, let me ask you one last question and then if we have... Open to the to audience, anyone. okay. Now, no, should I just use the... Okay, let me use the... Um, this... Switch on. I don't know if this microphone is on. Is it on? Yes. Yes, it's on. Let me ask you one more question before, if we have time, we can have some questions from the audience. Um, I think I'm asking you a question about where, what the sources of hope are and where they're from. But let me read you two things that you've written quickly. And they both match with my own experience of South Africa in recent years. You say, you talk about the writing and intellectual class, and you say, the dispiriting thing is that the massive swath of the older political liberal nationalist elite, writers and artists and cultural figures, with a history of struggle against Mubarak, who were part of the revolution, and who are now unequivocally on side with the generals. Right, so it kind of collapse of extraordinary dimensions. And then you quote Naji from an article in 2015. 
and he talks about the zombie general, the zombie sheikh, the zombie president, zombie businessman, zombie ruling party, zombie opposition, zombie moderate Islam, and zombie extremist Islam. And you say the zombie cannot tolerate life. Najee's crime is not what he's written, it is more that he is alive. What are the prospects of life or renewal in Egypt today? It's on? It's on. Okay. Um, right. I think that basically one always has to uh, hold on to hope. I, rem I mean, you know, one reminds oneself of, the, of Gramsci saying um, when, when you lose, when you feel that you have reason to lose the optimism of the heart, you have to activate the optimism of the will. So basically, there's, there's no point in not being an optimist, and you can be an optimist and a realist at the same time. I think that there are, um, that there are things that have changed ir irrevocably. I mean, for example, nobody was talking, I know it's a small thing, but nobody was talking about LGBT rights before the revolution in Egypt. Now it's there. It's obviously not mainstream, but at least it's out there. Um, there are things, I mean, there is a fight back that is happening constantly in every possible arena that permits it. So, um, for example, over the last three days, uh, there was a decision. You know that we've floated the pound and that the Egyptian pound, when Sisi came to power, the dollar bought you seven and a half Egyptian pounds. Um, at the moment, the dollar will buy you 19 Egyptian pounds, and it's probably going to get worse. So alongside that, they're doing other things, um, which nobody can understand what the overall strategy is. But one thing that they suddenly did was to uh, declare that there would be no import duty on chicken. So anybody who imported chicken would not pay import duty. Now, obviously, that will kill your chicken industry, your local chicken industry. And so there was a, a hue and cry about it. And within 24 hours, because of social media, people had found out and put out that, the, that somebody had bought a huge shipment of chicken and it was in the sea on its way to Egypt. And that basically the timing of this had been such that this person was going to benefit from the slide of the Egyptian pound and from the removal of customs duty. And that the person to whom this shipment belonged was the head of the Chamber of Commerce for uh, poultry and whatever. Now, because of the hue and cry on social media, uh, the government had to go back. I mean, there was a statement by the prime minister that this customs thing was going to be um, was was going to to be cancelled. And so now he's being pursued in order to declare that nobody would benefit from the 48 hours in which uh, it had happened. So that's resistance. There's resistance in the courts. Uh, brilliant, brilliant lawyers who continue to um, work through the courts, even though the, the courts are very often a travesty. And even things like, like local, stuff like local activities that you take for granted um, here, for example, or in England, which is uh, just NGOs working to create libraries, to create, you know, to sort of just make people's lives better on the ground, are working and are extremely active. Now, Again, last week, the government managed to pass a law that basically outlaws most NGOs. So there is a battle going on, but nobody's lying down and giving up. Um, and so I have, I, have, I have hope. I have hope in people's, um, well, insistence, really, on, on trying to make life better in the future. And I have a lot of hope because young people are far less... Um, far, far less hoodwinked and far less likely. Uh, they just don't take this government seriously. You know, it's like they're just waiting for it to collapse. Of course, it's Egypt. Your governments tend to last for 
don't, don't. Thousands of years. <laughs> um, could we, I think Not we have time. <laughs> I think we have time for some, for some questions. Uh, maybe a microphone. Sonia, I am Muhammad Wajiuddin, journalist with the Times of India. I have two questions. When the Arab Spring started, we had hopes that many monarchies will change and it will lead to democratic society. But as far as Egypt is concerned, after 40 years of Mubarak's rule, Hosni Mubarak, it was replaced with a fanatic like Mursi and then he was replaced or deposed by army general. So do you think that this Arab Spring has petered out? Has it lost its force? Has it lost its momentum? That's one question. Another question is about my fellow brothers and journalists. I'm talking about the journalist community in Egypt. Is there any space? There are so many journalists inside jail. Is there a space left for them, for the bloggers, for the independent, individuals who are fighting for democratic rights, is there any space left or have they all been co-opted or have they become the foot soldiers in media for the government? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, this is, these are brief answers. Um, I think that phase one of the Arab revolutions is, yeah, phase one is, is over. Um, and we're in phase two, which is the triumph of the counter-revolution. But there will be phase three, and maybe four and five and six. But it is, it is by no means over. It hasn't petered out. It isn't over. It is a, a phase of, of defeat. Um, but it will change. And uh, yes, there is room. People are still fighting the good fight, even though, I mean, Hossein Bahgat is one of our best investigative journalists. He was more or less kidnapped. They questioned him. Uh, they kept him for four days, and the outcry was so loud that they had to let him go. He continues to do his work. Um, so people are very, very bravely carrying on. Uh, some uh, from within Egypt on... Uh, media platforms, uh, a, a very good media platform, for example, is Mada Masr, and that publishes in English and Arabic. That's Mada, M-A-D-A, Masr, M-A-S-R. It's excellent. Um, and um, as long as they continue, then there will be proper news coming out of Egypt and investigative journalism. And of course, and blogs continue, and people are on Twitter and on Facebook, outspoken. Um, so yes, there is, there is room in the alternative media, uh, and it's being used. Yeah, hi. Excuse could, could, could me. Yeah, could we collect maybe three questions together and then, and then Adaf will answer them? Right. Uh, my name is Faridun Sharyar. I'm from, I'm an, uh, I'm an entertainment journalist uh, based on this uh, website called Bollywood Hangama. Uh, I've been visiting Egypt for the last two years for this uh, India by the Nile festival. And uh, I think amazing people, but uh, what I've observed is last year when I went, like this year, this year when I, when I went compared to, to last year, I noticed the, the tourism is, is drastically, in fact, coming down and uh, uh, there are some amazing, uh, in fact, tourist uh, spots over there, be it the pyramids, even Luxor, for example, and Alexandria. But somehow it is, uh, it is having a very deserted look right now and it, the, the margin is, is, has drastically improved. So how do you look at the tourism aspect of uh, Egypt, which is world famous? Thank you. There's somebody here. There's somebody here. I don't know whether. Could we could we give another microphone to the to the gentleman here? And somebody here. Good afternoon, madam. <clears throat> I am deeply moved uh, by the spirit of uh, revolution in Egypt which was for democracy. I have two questions. Uh, do you think America could have supported this in a more positive way? And has Egypt lost because of a lack of uh, strong leadership? And I see this Arab Springs phenomenon being fizzled out because of strong leadership. So what are your views on this? And then one more question, and then I think we probably have to close the questions. Yeah, hi. My name is Ayub Khan. 
Uh, I believe we, uh, the world knows that we have uh, the Geneva Convention that speaks about war crimes that you cannot commit against people. Uh, you have constitutions of countries that speak about what a, a, a citizen can do and cannot do. We also have something which is the National Human Rights Convention. But I feel compared to all these other conventions, I find the National Human Rights Conven uh, Convention such a toothless and helpless organization that really does not scare uh, uh, governments into uh, acting out against their citizens. Is there a move to try and make this more prominent, more strong, have a better voice? Uh, yeah, well, uh, Ayub Khan, thank you. I think uh, it's, this is a very difficult question. I, I, I don't know what such a move would look like. I mean, ultimately, ultimately, um, such organizations and such conventions are dependent on people, states agreeing to abide by them. I mean, there is really, to enforce them, you need to, um, well, you need to get to a point where the United Nations actually sanctions a country. And, well, we all know how sanctions work and how political they are. I mean, there are countries right now that thoroughly deserve sanctioning, but nobody's even talking about it. So this is very difficult, and it's a question for all of us rather than, than for me. Um, on the uh, America, uh, well, on, could America have supported? I really don't know what America could have done. Um, this was very much uh, an Egyptian thing, and um, I, th I actually think that the Americans didn't quite know what to do, and they were, I mean, the American administration, and they were kind of waiting, and eventually they decided to back the Brotherhood because there was a democratic process and Mohammed Morsi was elected. And the Americans, I think, I think the American administration essentially wants somebody it can do business with. It doesn't care what that person is, but it cares that they can deliver. If they say we will do this, that they will do it. And the Brotherhood can deliver because they have their cadres and, and so on. And he wasn't fanatic. He was just ridiculous. But he really wasn't fanatic. He was corrupt and ridiculous, just like Mubarak was. So I, d I don't know. I think that the Americans now could be making more noises about human rights, for example. I mean, it could just be that every time they have a meeting, since they give so much arms, they give you know, so much weapons um, and you know, training and all the rest of it to the regime, that they could at least mention human rights uh, every time they handed over some bullets or something. Um, strong leadership, I'm not really sure. I think that um, it's very hard, it's very, very hard to imagine in our situation that you would have a strong leader who was genuinely a revolutionary because the moment people, I mean, the people who are in prison now, I could name you, but I won't, three of the young people who are in prison, who are in prison simply because they look like they could be potential leaders in six, seven, eight years' time. And so I think something else is required, really, uh, some kind of way of, of uniting, uniting voices without having somebody out there as a leader who could be killed or co-opted or imprisoned. And finally, on the tourism question, yes, of course, tourism has gone down. And um, that is really, really bad because you have about 10 million people in the country who are utterly dependent on the tourist industry. But the, I think that tourists um, are not going to come back as long as the situation looks so volatile and it will continue to look volatile as long as the regime is cracking down on human rights, on the media um, and, and so on. And so when there is real stability and people can go back to feeling secure when they visit Egypt, then they will visit Egypt. But, uh, but at the moment, that's, that it, it's not a desirable um, situation to come to, really. So. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. I think that they Yes. Thank you, Duff. It's a real honor to be able to I'm talk so, to you. I'm so, so glad to be here. Thank you so much, Mumbai. And thank you to The Times. And thank you so much, Amran. <laughs>